First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Right, everyone, my name is Cathy Smith. I'd like to give you a brief introduction about the library system. Every good student should learn how to use the library. If you have to do a research project, the library is the place to go to for information. Libraries contain books and periodicals, magazines and newspapers on many different subjects. To find the information you need, you must know how to use the library. All libraries are organised in much the same way. Every library houses a collection of books. Many libraries also have periodicals, films and records. All the books in a library can be classified under two main categories, fiction and non-fiction. Books of fiction contain stories that were made up by the author. Books of non-fiction contain factual material. When doing research, you use non-fiction books because you are looking for factual information. All the fictional books in a library are grouped in one section. They are arranged alphabetically by the last name of the author. Many libraries also label the spines of all books of fiction with the letters FIC or F. All libraries have a system for organising and classifying non-fiction books. The most widely used system is the Dewey Decimal System. It was designed by an American librarian named Melvin Dewey. It is called the Decimal System because it divides all non-fiction books into ten major categories. These are further divided into subdivisions. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. For example, all science books are numbered from 500 through 599. Each different field of science has a number within the 500 category. For example, astronomy is 520 and chemistry is 540. The Dewey Decimal System provides a category for every type of non-fiction book. The best way to locate a book in the library is to use the card catalogue. The card catalogue is an index of all the books in the library. Information about a book is listed on cards. All the cards are filed alphabetically and stored in drawers in large cabinets. The card catalogue can help you locate a particular book, a book on a certain subject or a book by a particular author. In the card catalogue, each book has three cards, an author card, a title card and a subject card. The author card is alphabetized under the author's name. The title card is filed alphabetically according to the title of the book. The subject card is filed alphabetically under the name of the subject of the book. In many university libraries, they use their own Biblitus cataloguing system or the microfiche system. Both of them list publications under author and title, and both are very easy to use. Now, let us see the reference books. We all know that reference books make up important part of a library's non-fiction books collection. They contain facts and information about any subject you can think of. Reference books are not meant to be read from cover to cover. You should use them when you want important facts and information about a particular subject. Let's see some major types of reference books. First, dictionaries. Dictionaries are books that list and give the meanings of the words in a language. They also give the pronunciation of words in a dictionary which are listed alphabetically. Second is encyclopedias. 
Encyclopedias are reference books that provide factual information about people, events, places, and subjects of lasting interest. Each article is written by a specialist on the topic being discussed. An encyclopedia usually consists of a number of books arranged in a set. The volumes are arranged in alphabetical order according to the topic of each article. Letters are stamped on the spine of each volume to indicate the alphabetical rang of the topics in each volume. For instance, if you wanted to find information about the moon, you would look in volume eight of the encyclopedia pictured here. Next is atlases. An atlas is a book of maps. It may contain many different kinds of maps. The maps in an atlas are often arranged alphabetically by country or continent. Almanacs are also a type of reference books. An almanac is a book that contains recent statistics and summaries of information on a wide variety of topics. It is published annually. Information is listed alphabetically by subject. Indexes are alphabetical lists of names, titles, and subjects that tell where information about each can be found in other publications. For example, the Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature can help you find magazine articles that have been published about a particular subject. It will give you the names of publications that have carried articles about the subject, the dates and volume numbers of the particular issue in which the articles appeared. You should be aware that reference books may not be taken out of the library under any circumstances; they are used only in the library. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear someone talking to a group of university students. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to seventeen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to seventeen. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Upton University. I hope you are settling in and beginning to find your way around. I know how confusing it can be when you start life at university, and that's why we have Freshers' Week to help you find your feet. Before I go any further, I should perhaps introduce myself. My name is Sally Jackson, and I am the secretary of the Students Union, which has organized this week of events for you. You will usually find me in the office on the first floor of this building when I'm not attending lectures. Anyway, down to business. Of course, there are a few things that you are obliged to get done during your first week here. But once you've opened a bank account, if you haven't got one already, senior director of studies to discuss which courses you are going to take and signed up with a doctor, there will be plenty of time left to enjoy the events we have arranged for the week. And have we got a lot lined up for you? Throughout the week, from Monday to Friday. Every morning, starting at 10 a.m., there will be orientation and welfare events. These will include tours of the campus, which, as you have probably noticed, is the size of a small town with 9,000 residential students, as well as sessions on developing study skills. We also have tours of Upton itself arranged for you, with a bus leaving from outside this building every afternoon at five o'clock. There are a number of interesting things to do and see in and around Upton, so you can expect visits to the castle and museum, as well as the popular Ghost Walk. 
You'll need to sign up for this one, as numbers are limited. Just put your name on the list on the notice board in the entrance lobby. An important event is scheduled for Monday, that's the day after tomorrow, when we will be holding the academic fair. This is an opportunity for you to speak to students and academic staff about the courses that are on offer. The academic fair starts at 1 o'clock, by the way. There are a couple of other fairs that I think will interest you. First of all, we have the Society's Fair on Tuesday the 16th, which I think is an absolute must. You might not believe it, but the university has over 150 societies and sports clubs you can sign up for, so you are sure to find something of interest to you. That also starts at 1 o'clock, and it will be here in the Union Building. Also in this building is the Trade Fair on Wednesday, from 2 until 5 in the afternoon. This one might sound a bit strange because you will find a load of banks and other businesses here trying to get your custom. You will find plenty of bargains and, best of all, a lot of the businesses give away stuff for free. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. We've also got a great entertainment program lined up for you, starting tonight with our welcoming party. We have a top band lined up for your entertainment, but I'm not allowed to say who they are. All I can say is that I am sure you will not be disappointed. So come along to Blackmore Hall at 9 o'clock this evening to get your university experience off to a flying start. Just one point. I'm afraid this event is limited to freshers only. Because of space restrictions, you can't bring a friend tonight. Sorry about that. There's more fun and games on Monday in the Cotswold Theater here on campus. We have booked two of the cleverest comedians in the country, Paul Frazier and Jenny Brown, for a three-hour show. Paul has assured us that he and Jenny have packed the show with new material, and as they always get rave reviews for their shows, I think we can look forward to an evening of great entertainment. That's in the Cotswold Theater on Monday evening at 7.30. Moving along a bit, on Thursday, there is an important date for your diaries. This is the official Freshers Opening Ceremony, when the Dean welcomes you to Upton University. So remember, Thursday the 18th from 2.30 to 3.30 in Blackmore Hall. You certainly should go to this one, and by the way, light refreshments will be available. At the end of the week, on Saturday, you have the chance to dress up in your smartest evening wear for the official Freshers' Ball. Actually, although it's called a ball, it is quite a relaxed affair, so we are more than happy if you turn up wearing jeans and a t-shirt. The important thing is to relax and enjoy yourselves. Time and place are the same as for this evening's party. Blackmore Hall from 9 in the evening to 3 o'clock in the morning. Right. I think I've covered the most important and exciting events we have lined up for you, but there will be plenty of other things going on throughout the week, so remember to check the notice board in the entrance lobby regularly. Enjoy the rest of the day, and I look forward to meeting as many of you as possible this evening at the welcoming party. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a lecture about the world's energy. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. The world's energy comes from a number of different sources, which may be broadly classified into two categories. The first, which includes fossil fuels and minerals such as oil, coal, natural gas, uranium, etc., comprises sources of energy that are non-renewable. The second category, which includes the wind. The waves, the tides, the temperature of the oceans, and the sun comprises sources that will continue to provide energy in virtually unlimited quantities as long as the Earth and the sun exist. And yet, despite the fact that they are, to all intents and purposes, inexhaustible, the sources of this second category remain almost untapped. Most energy is produced today by burning hydrocarbon fuels drawn from the world's non-renewable reserves. The amount of these potential reserves, by which is generally meant the quantity that can be extracted by present or conceivable future techniques, is a matter of some controversy. This is understandable. If we consider the enormous difficulties involved in determining how much fuel nature has hidden in the earth, and how much of it is or will become accessible, and the fact that different countries use different methods of estimation, before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Proven recoverable reserves, i.e., those whose extraction is already an economically feasible proposition, are considerably smaller. The great difference between potential and proven recoverable reserves is explained by the fact nature has placed so much of this fossil fuel in remote parts of the globe, at depths. And in quantities that makes its extraction unjustifiable at present in economic terms. Let us now compare proven recoverable reserves with estimated consumption. Between now and the year two thousand ten, the quantity of energy required by the world will account for almost ten percent of its proven recoverable fossil fuels. If no other source of energy is employed. Seventy-eight percent of these fuels will have been used up by the year two thousand fifty, while a hundred years later, according to the most moderate long-term forecast, there will be none left. Comparison of consumption with potential reserves produces a somewhat brighter picture. By the year two thousand ten, the demand for energy will have used up only three point six percent of these reserves. And by 2050, 26 percent. A century later, about half of these reserves will still remain. These comparisons clearly show that the world's stock of chemical fuels is quite sufficient to cover its energy requirements for at least another hundred years. There is thus no immediate danger of, as it were, emptying the coal bucket. On the other hand. These reserves of fuel are limited, and within the foreseeable future, there could be none left. It is possible that our children's grandchildren might find themselves in a world drained dry of natural gas and oil. 
we should thus lose no time in thinking about ways and means of producing artificial oil or artificial gas, and above all, of producing energy in unlimited quantities from sources which in no way threaten the environment. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture about project management being given by a university lecturer. First, look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen to the lecture and answer questions 31 to 40. I'd like to begin today with a quick review of last week's lecture. We saw the definition of project management as something which has a clear beginning and a clear completion date with goals, a budget and a schedule. We saw its presence in the private and public sectors in many different industries. You'll also remember that we outlined the life cycle, as it were, of a project and looked at the first of a four-stage cycle, establishing the limits of the project. Today we're going to talk broadly about the second stage of project management. Developing a plan for the project. Next week we'll focus on the implementation of the project and then the final stage, its evaluation. Let's get started on today's topic though, planning the project. The success of a project will depend on the skills and care which you put in at this initial planning stage. Planning is not only necessary in terms of budget or cost, it's also crucial that you consider the time frame of a project and the standards which you'll be expected to provide. These three elements are, of course, integrated. Project planning is best conducted as a team. You might have to take responsibility for handing over the final plan, but without a team behind you, you'll find it almost impossible to plan effectively. We'll discuss budgetary planning firstly, because that is, of course, what you are most likely to be evaluated on by your own manager. Before drawing up a budget, you'll need to understand the time frame involved to carry out the work and the standard of delivery at which the labour and materials are to be supplied. Now, this is arguably the most difficult to plan for. You'll never plan completely accurately for a project in terms of money, but you will become better at planning realistically. And it is this part of the planning process that you will do last. The best way to plan the cost of a project is to consider all the factors involved and how those factors relate to time and standard of delivery. Write these down on a spreadsheet format and begin the task of costing and estimating. The company that you're employed by will always have their own systems in place for doing this. They will also indicate the kind of profit they are looking for, usually in percentage terms. The second stage of planning is the allocation of time to a project, and for this you'll have to canvass others for help. Only by asking the advice and opinions of those with expertise in the field will you be able to establish the size of each unit of work to be completed and the order in which those units of work should be carried out. Remember that some units of work may be done simultaneously, but many cannot. In your tutorials this week, you'll be introduced to the Gantt chart. That's G A N. This method of planning project activities has been very successful in the field of project management. The complete set of tasks involved in a project are identified and then planned in relation to each other. You'll soon discover 
that organizing and prioritizing activities is quite an art form. The third part of your planning, as I said, will affect your money and time considerations, and that is the standard of delivery that the project demands. These standards will be outlined in the tender documents, if they've been your guide or the master plan from which you're working. Always make sure that you For every unit of work that is to be completed, you'll have to write specifications. They are detailed descriptions outlining specific standards of quality in materials and labour. If these specifications are not carefully written and then complied with, the project is unlikely to be successful. These specifications will be referred to many times once the project is underway. You will also have to deal with a quality assurance manager at this stage who will advise you on the standards which need to be met. Quality management has become a valued component in successful project management companies. I've provided you with an outline of the planning process for project management, but you'll be looking at these three elements in more depth in your tutorials this week. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to your IELTS listening answer sheet. That is the end of the test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to your IELTS listening answer sheet. That is the end of the test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to your IELTS listening answer sheet.